Hi everyone, I'm Matt Cremona. And I'm Matthew Moores. And welcome to the Matt and Matthew Show. So this episode was originally going to be a longer episode. It was about routing and patterns in your work. That turned out to be a little longer. We ended up talking for a bit longer than one show length. So we're going to split up into two episodes. So in this first one, we're going to be talking about routing. And then in the next episode, we'll be talking about pattern work or using patterns or not patterns of plans and patterns in our work. Well, what Matt really wants to tell you is that I talked for about 25 minutes while he was asleep, and um, that's really how the episode got as long as it did. So um, let's get into it. So uh, routers are a lot of fun. We use them in our shops all the time, and you can't see, but if I did pan the camera down, my table would be full of router stuff right now. Um, and so let's go over a couple of different types. So um, I know I've got well, I've got maybe four or five routers. Um, how about you, Matt? What do you got over there? I have four routers. So and I think we have some of the same ones, right? So like I have one of these little um, mini uh, DeWalt's. Yep, I've got the same one. I, I got it with the plunge base though. And I got the fixed base. Or do you have that? Ah. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> right, And um, but I love this little guy. This guy is great for putting a chamfer bit on or a round over bit. Or um, I do a lot of inlay work with this one too. How about you, Matt? I just got this one just a couple months ago, actually. So I haven't had a whole lot of, op of opportunities to actually play around with it and use it a lot. But so far, I really like this little plunge, the plunge base a lot. Uh, I just like the size of it. It's so, com it's so compact, it's really easy to control. And since I keep my bigger router in my router table most of the time, it's one less hassle for me to go and take my router out of my router table put it in my base and then take it to the work. And you know, it's, it's bigger, it's, he it's a lot heavier. Um, and most of the time for a lot of stuff I'm doing in my shop, this is more than powerful enough to do anything I want. So in reality, this is, you know, if I was starting over again, I would almost say, I guess the price isn't that different to be honest, but if the price difference was bigger, I'd say all you need is this, or you know, one of these size. Right, yeah, I like reach, reaching for this one too. And then what you can really do to expand its capabilities is to get one of these guys. I know you've got an edge guide too, or maybe two of them. Yep, I've um, got this one. Is, yeah, this is the, the uh, edge guide for the, this DeWalt. But um, what's really neat about this edge guide with this plunge base is um, you can change out these rods right here. So these are the rods for the, the small little plunge base. And if I change these guys out, they'll work for the full size um, DeWalt router as well. And it has this uh, really other cool feature on it, which is the micro adjust here on the back. I got an edge guide for all of the all of my routers. This is the one for my for my Bosch router, but it has that, that micro adjust is really handy. Yeah, so those are really great. But I also have a couple other ones too. So that's a full size. I have another full size one, which is this Craftsman one, which I've had forever. It has three bases one of those D bases, which I've mm -hmm. never used ever. Um, <laughs> not that they're not good, I've just never had a reason for it. Um, but the reason why I went from this to uh, the, the wall actually was when I bought a full size router table. So I wanted something just for the router table and not just for, um, so I have another one that's floating around, I guess. Uh, you know, first world problems, right? <laughs> And then, um, then I have one that's always in the box, which is this guy here. It's another Craftsman router, but this is actually kind of important. It's one of the really cheap ones. It's a fixed base, 9.5 amp, whatever. I think you can get them for $100. But the reason I have this is I have the, another one of these inside the multi-router, um, which is a backup for that one. So the reason I bought two was that the multi-router has a... You have to screw in the, the router into the multi-router. And it just seems to be hard for me, at least, to find um, routers that have the right base configuration to screw into it. So once I found one, I, just, I buy extra. So is that just the, the mounting holes for it? Or is it like the, the size of the, of the actual unit? I'm not really sure. Like, how does it screw into it? Uh, it's the mounting hole. So if you took you know, this one, for oh, instance. The, the actual the base plate? Yeah, the plate and where oh, all okay. the the screws are you have to get that to match their screw system there and I don't think they've updated their screw system where all their the locations are placed for a long time so yeah, I didn't I didn't realize that it was mounted in there with the base plate too or from the, with the base 
Okay. Yeah, the, yeah, the base is there, and then you got to take the handles off, and and um, so it's that these seem to work, and so I bought a couple of them because of that. So what kind of stuff do you usually do? Do you have a full-size router table, Matt, or do you just you got a smaller one? Or yeah, I've got a, a full-size router table that I made myself. Oh, I don't know, 2011, I think it was. So it was a few years ago, uh, when I made it, I was I was like, oh, you can make it as big as you want. So I went big. <laughs> I think it's uh. It's like 45 inches by maybe 30 inches or so, so it's a pretty big, the tabletop is big. And that's that's really nice for anything where you're gonna have a lot, you need bigger pieces, you wanna support that weight. So a lot of like template routing is really nice to do on there because you have so much area to put the, the work piece on. So that's, that's really nice. And it gives me more places to throw crap in my shop, you know, another horizontal surface. Yeah, we always <laughs> need places to store stuff. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I have a I have an Incra router table. I'm I'm a big Incra fan. Um, it's I think 26 by 36 or something like that. But the um, router's not in the center. It's uh, on the edge, closer to one of the edges. And I like that because, um, well, this is a whole nother discussion for another day. Which is <laughs> you cut your dovetails by hand. Um, I tend to use the Incra because I can set it up really quickly. So we'll just table that for another day, but yeah, so that's why I got um, that guy, and I just love the precision on the Incra. But same thing, nice large surface so that you can uh, do template routing and be able to support that piece along, if not its entire length, but at least a large portion of it. You bring up a good point with the with the positioning of the actual router uh, plate to the router lift on the table. I mean, I, I see a lot of times where people will put the the router lift right in the middle. I have mine set uh, towards the back, actually, so I have more room in the front uh, if I want to do a, a dado or, or something like that so I can have the fence further away from it or further towards it or whatever. So I have a little more space that way just because it's offset because there really is no, there's no reason it has to be perfectly dead in the middle. You can put it wherever you want in the tabletop. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so my, yeah, mine's offset to one direction, uh, but yeah, the, I don't know if there's any particular way that's better than others. It just depends on the type of work you're doing, maybe. That's the thing I like about the idea of building your own router table, especially. With building a lot of your own stuff, it's nice because you can do it however you want. With the router table especially, you can make it whatever size you want. You can make it whatever height off the ground you want. You can put that router lift wherever you want. You can get different kinds of router lifts. There's really a lot you can do there. It's a really good, uh, good project to make because there's so much involved there. Especially if you're just getting into woodworking and you want to do something more like cabinetry with plywood. So building that base for that thing really gets you into that mindset of, you know, however, however you decide to construct it, mine's constructed with dados and rabbits. So it, it was a good um, practice on creating dados for plywood, which is not three quarter inches. It's, or, you know, it's a little, thin, a little thinner than, than the size stated. So being able to work around that in your shop is, is something you need to have a way to do. So a project like that's a great learning experience by far. Yeah, absolutely. So on your table, when you built that, um, did you put a router lift in it? Or are you doing the, the lifting by hand by going underneath and, and turning the knob and moving it up and down? No, I, I bought a router lift for it. I had a small, uh, well, it was like small bench top router tables before that. And it was just like that. It was, uh, you go underneath it and you got, you know, adjust the router manually because it's, it's just a plate. And that was, that was not that much fun. So, so I went to a router lift. <laughs> I don't have a lift yet. I still do the manual thing, um, but I don't know. I, I guess I spent my money on the Incra fence and everything, and I skipped the lift. Maybe sometime in the future I'll do the lift, um, but you wouldn't got the materials, and you put your money into the lift. Yeah, and it, I think it depends on the router you have in the lift as well, or in the in the plate, and how easy that thing is to adjust. the The router I had in that my old router table was an old Craftsman that um, it had like a rack rack and pinion um, height adjustment. And that thing wasn't, it didn't, when you tighten it down, it would, the bit height would drop a little bit. So that was kind of annoying too. So that's why I got rid of that one, right? I upgraded to my Bosch, um, just because that was really annoying. <laughs> but it didn't really have a good way to do really nice micro adjusting. Cause even just turning that dial a little bit, it was a pretty big uh, jump in the depth. I, it wasn't really, it was from like probably the 70s. It wasn't really made for really fine work like that. So that, that kind of put me off on the plate for sure. 
Right. Well, th I have the DeWalt, one of these more expensive DeWalts. So I don't know what the number is. Uh, 618. But um, for mine, uh, I have the, this with the fixed base in the plate. And I have the same problem that you just described, Matt, which is when you try to um, turn the, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, but anyway, you, you turn this circular bracket or whatever and you change the height and then you lock. Adjustment the, ring? Yes, exactly. The adjustment ring. When you lock that in, uh, it still actually changes the height a little bit. So I kind of. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I just need to, I, I count for it, I work around it. It's not the end of the world, but that happens even with this guy too. Yeah, well, at least you know about it. The, the worst part is when you don't know that's happening and you can't figure out why your things are off. <laughs> yeah, and then for your, I don't know, for mine, I make sure my router is a multi-speed router that's at the, at the, the bench. All of them are, um, and that's really nice. Some, this, some of the less expensive ones don't allow you to change speeds on them, and I guess I'm going to use it to segue into router bits, but the size of the bit um, also determines the speed at which the router should be running as well. Because you want that same cut velocity at the edge of the bit. Right. So you know, if you if you got this thing on whatever the highest number is on this guy, it's six. So I don't know what that equals. Probably <laughs> twenty thousand know, RPMs. It probably it's probably it's going to be in twenty thousand. Probably twenty twenty five. Right. But yeah. So I have some bits that should never be run that fast unless you're looking to kill yourself. Oh yeah, you run that, you run those big bits at 20,000 RPMs, the rim speed or the speed at the cutting edge is gonna be like 100 miles an hour when it should only be 60. I don't know what the actual speed is, but. <laughs> yeah, like this William Ings, uh, his big daddy bit. Yep, that's a big yeah, bit. Yeah, so this guy here. Yeah, it's, it's crazy, it's in, I think it's an uh, inch and a quarter across. Or inch and an eight. Yeah, you don't want to be spinning that thing at 25,000 RPMs. <laughs> no, it's got six cutter heads. And um, yeah, the outside's spinning faster than than the inside, right? Well, it's spinning, it's spinning at the same speed, but it's traveling at a different velocity because it's further from the center. Yes, exactly. Tangential velocity. Exactly. High school physics. <laughs> yes, I, I, I did physics AP, but that was a long time ago. <laughs> I got a three on my test. I didn't get a four or five. I only got a three, so. <laughs> it's passing. But, um, yeah, barely. <laughs> but um, uh, this guy is pretty cool, too, because uh, you can actually cut. You can go from straight grain to end grain on this thing if you're template routing. And you've got, um, uh, how do I want to put this? Um, you're not afraid. So you really got to you know, hold it down tight, get right into the, the bit with the piece. And you can go from straight to, uh, to end grain and back to straight without any tear out whatsoever, if it's sharpened well. Yeah, plus it's at, it's at a, um, it's, a, it's at a spiral, right? It's not straight. It's not a straight fluted thing. It's at a right. uh, it's got, spiral. Yeah, it's got six flutes. They're all spiral. Yeah, so you have a nice shear cut. Exactly, it's shear cut. Yep. Yeah, and that's the, the bottom bearing one. I've also um, went a little crazy. <laughs> And um, I love the bit so much, and he came out with this top bearing one, so I picked up this guy as well. And this is great too, because sometimes I would use the other one, the other bit, which is the bottom bearing, mm -hmm. and, you, and you got this thing spinning, and the, like the top half inch is exposed. Oh yeah, that's and, true, if you're, using, if you're doing a thin work piece or something. <laughs> right, and, and, you're, and I've got, and I like my hands, you know? <laughs> so um, that's why I ended up going with this guy too, because now I can turn the temple around upside down, or however you want to look at it, but have it running against the top bearing instead of the bottom, and have the rest of the bit buried in the table. Mm -hmm. Much safer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, especially if you fell over for some reason. Right, right. Like your dog comes in and knocks you over all of a sudden. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So what kind of, uh, um, do you have any special bits as well, Matt? Not that special. <laughs> um, let's see here. I have some of the bits that I use the most in my router, my work here. I use my half-inch uh, spiral bit quite a bit for all kinds of stuff, mostly if I'm going to be hogging out a lot of material. I built, when I built my workbench, I bought this bit and all the joinery on the bench is cut with this one bit. And before that, I had only used a, a quarter inch spiral. And the difference is, it's incredible. It's, it's this, this it cuts so much more efficiently than that little tiny quarter inch bit. It's amazing. Um, 
So I use that quite a bit. Is that an up cut or a down cut? This is an up cut, I think. I don't remember anymore. Well, there's the, and there's two different types, guys. There's an up cut spiral bit and a down cut spiral bit. So the up cut pulls the, um, uh, the chips up. You don't, I uh, think, correct me if I'm wrong, Matt. So you'll have a- This is up. Right, it pulls them up and you'll have a cleaner cut on the top, but it will be a little less clean at the bottom. The down cut is the opposite direction. So you want to use an up cut when you're mortising. Like, so if you, use a, if you want to do a plunge routing and cut mortises, you want to use an up cut bit and then you want to use a down cut bit. Um, in that case, the up cut bit will pull the chips out of the cut for you. Right. But it's going to leave uh, fuzzies and a little bit of maybe possibly tear out on the surface because you're pulling stuff up through the, through the board. But if okay. you wanted, in that case, if you wanted a really clean uh, cut on the surface, you want a down cut because then you're actually pushing the bits, the chips down, or you're making the cut into the board. As the right. as the cutter comes around, it's shearing down into the board itself. But then you have that whole chip thing because then you're pushing chips down into the to the cut, which might not be a big deal if you're not doing anything deep. But if you're doing a mortise, that's pretty deep usually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So what else do you got over there? I have my, I didn't grab it, but I have my, um, my big, um, whatever it's called, the big uh, bottom clearing bit that I use for my, um, my flattening. flattening apparatus thingy, my bobber thingy. <laughs> so when I did all my cutting boards, when I flatten a slab, that's a nice, it's an inch and a half diameter. It's basically an inch and a half diameter straight bit so I can run that thing over the whole surface of a board or whatever I'm trying to flatten and I can clean up the whole face of that with the router instead of using the planer or the jointer because the thing I'm trying to flatten is either end grain, like my, of course in the case of a cutting board, or it is just too big for the, my tools. Yeah, absolutely. One other thing that I'll, I'll, I'll mention that I got recently for making the, uh, the gooseneck moldings on my secretary was a collet extension. And I haven't, I didn't have one of these before and I didn't really have a reason to get one, but this thing is super handy now. and I. I think I'll end up using this a lot in my shop because there's been a lot of times where I wanted to make a cut and my router just didn't have enough depth travel to actually get to where I want to go. With this, that's a whole extra, oh, I don't know, like inch and a half or two inches of, of cut depth that you have just by using this thing. And originally I had thought that this was going to be a little more troublesome like as far as vibration goes. But this one is really well machined, so it has like no run out and there's no vibration with this thing in the, in the router, which is awesome. Does that collet extension that you have there, Matt, does that also have a, like the quick change stuff with the Allen wrench at the, or do you have to use a regular wrench to uh, tighten that up? This is a wrench variety. It's just like, it's just like the, uh, the collet on my router. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've been looking at the, um, the quick change ones. Those seem to be pretty cool. That's faster for the bit changes, that's for sure. Yeah, of course, more money to spend, and that means something else to hide from the wife <laughs> or the girlfriend, right? Never ending. <laughs> yeah, but you know, sometimes um, you may not be able to find the bit that you want. So for you, you couldn't find the bit for the molding. Oh, I could, but I don't like paying for it. Oh, okay, see? Good, a good man. <laughs> that way you don't have to hide it at all. You just don't do it. I could have one made for that profile, but it would have been about $400. Uh, chump change for you, right? It, it would be, as I, if anyone's seen that video or followed that process, I've talked about it pretty openly. If I was making a lot of these things, no questions asked, I would go buy that. I would get that bit that same day because it would save you so much time. But right. I'm only doing it maybe once, maybe twice, maybe once in a while. And it's not, it's not too big of a deal, I guess. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's just a little bit extra work, a little more sweat, and that's it. And it'll, you'll love the piece so much more for that, too. I already do. All right. So, um, what do you have any other specialty bits? I guess the only other, like specialty that people probably never don't see that often is an ovalo bit. I've got one of those. It's basically a roundover bit without the post for the for the bearing on it, so you can put it right through the middle of a, a workpiece or through the middle of a board or whatever, and not have to worry about that bearing getting in the way. And I also made one myself too, just by taking a standard roundover bit and just grinding that post off. Okay, makes sense. Um, and sometimes you need to buy bits too for particular sizes. So like, I do a lot of inlay work in my green and green furniture. So like when I do the, the sterling silver inlay, I try to buy a bit and then I match the silver 
a size. So like an eighth of an inch bit and I'll buy the sterling silver in a certain size. And then I have a whole bunch of other bits too. These guys are, um, they're a little bit smaller. It's hard to see, um, but they're not actually for um, any of these routers I just showed you. They're for my little Fordham. Um, and there, this one's 1 16th of an inch and this guy here is uh, 1 32nd. Wow, that's tiny. Yeah, absolutely. You can't go deep with them. They're, they don't have a, a deep cutter head, but they're in for inlay work instead. So with the Fordham, I don't know if you've, uh, you guys have seen one of these before, but you, I bought this base, another William Ng um, product. It's a great little base that you take and you get the Fordham, if I can get it out of the box. It's almost like a little fancy Dremel kind of thing, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's got the, the, it has the shaft that's flexible. Yeah, and then it goes right in here. And then um, you get a little, you get the light and you can see what you're doing, which is really nice. So, you know, sometimes you want to do uh, inlay work if you're you know, trying to create a flower or uh, some kind of design or something like that. This is a, a, that's a really good thing to have too. Yeah. But it's a much more specialty thing. So if you want to get into that, obviously you need to buy the stuff, but not everybody needs it. Now, one thing we didn't really talk about that I think we could probably touch on is uh, plunged versus the fixed base routers. Good thought, Matt. What do you prefer? Do you use a fixed base router a whole lot or when do you use one or what? What's your take on plunge bases versus fixed base routers? Um, I actually use both, Matt. Um, you know, the plunge router is really great for mortising. Um, if you've got to cut dados and um, you can definitely, you don't have to necessarily use a fixed. You can get away with a plunge It'll do the same thing as a fix. You just set it to a depth that you need. But I, I'll switch over to the fixed if I'm doing uh, chamfering, for instance, or roundovers. So I want to set the depth once, and I don't want to be sitting there thinking, am I down all the way or I'm not down all the way? Um, and so then in that case, I'll definitely use a fixed base. But you no, know, those and they're not that much more to get the kit that has both the fixed and the the plunge. Um, I think the larger thing, if you're looking to buy a router, is to just buy a really good router. Because back to what we were talking about in our first episode, even right, <laughs> which is what do you do? So I've got you know all these routers here, and you've got all your routers there. And, and what happened? I, uh, you know, I, I guess what happened for me with the Dewalt was I bought a, a router table, so I I didn't need, but I wanted a router that was dedicated for the router table as well. Yeah, I and mean, for me when I the only reason I have more than one router is not because I was upgrading, is because I was adding another one into my shop so I didn't have to, you know, take it out of the router table or change a bit out that I had at a setting already. It was more of a convenience thing, that's why I have more than one. And going back to the plunge versus the fixed base thing, when I first started woodworking I only had a fixed base router. And then when I bought my my Bosch router, I just put that fixed base router on the fixed base um base. Fixed base base. <laughs> it's kinda of weird saying. I put that on there, I never used my plunge base. And then when I finally like started using my the plunge base, it was like this epiphany in my life. It's a whole new world. It was such a much a better experience. I could do so much more with the plunge base. I didn't realize like how hard I was making my life by only using that fixed base all the time. And I don't know, that was just this weird thing for me. I, I, always saw, I always saw people using the plunge bases, but I just, for whatever reason, I was like, I don't really want to try that, or I didn't want to use it, or whatever. But I really, I prefer fi I prefer plunge base now than I do my fixed base, by far. What's really nice about the plunges is I'm taking the little the little plunge router for the smaller Dewalt. Is um, once you start moving into actually using all these little stops, the settings here. Yes. These are great because you can dial in what you need to. So, uh, yeah, I don't know how many times, all the time. Well, not all the time, but a lot of time when I'm using this, I will use these as steps, especially if you're trying, if you're not trying, but if you're uh, routing multiple depths, I'll set the final depth um, and then I'll do all my stepping and down without having to think that I drop it down an eighth of an inch or not. And, and this takes a, some of the thinking out of that. Yeah, the, the power is really in that turret stop because it's so, there's so much uh, versatility and this like, uh, it just takes a lot of the guesswork out of what you're doing. Because if literally you want to go down a quarter of an inch, plunge the base, plunge the bit down to the contacts to work, zero it out, 
move that turret stop to a quarter inch, plunge down, you're a quarter inch. That's it. Right. There's no measuring, there's nothing, you just, just set up and go. Or if you yeah. want to do a weird depth, you can use like a drill bit to set that depth and you, you be plunging that amount. So if you want to plunge something weird like, I don't know, 764, you can do that <laughs> very accurately and very consistently. Since we both have a small and a large one of these handhelds and larger ones, I guess we both probably have half inch and quarter inch bits as well. So maybe we take a second to touch on that. Um, half inch bits are more stable, um, but you know, so when I try to do things that are larger, I'm not going to use a quarter inch bit. So I, I mean that's so I know you said earlier that you know do you think this would be your main one, but if you were doing it would be hard I think to try to mortise so do a half inch wide or a three quarter inch mortise with this guy. You probably wouldn't be doing anything too heavy duty like that, but for the most of the bits that I have on my table here, you know, like rounding over. You know, some simple straight bits, um, chamfering, things like that, the, the more common things to do in your shop, that I, those I can all do with my quarter inch um, bits. So the router table we have, I, at least I, I think no, you do too, we have a half inch or quarter inch that, that the larger ones can take both, and that makes them a little bit more versatile. Yeah, it does. It's um, just one more extra thing you have in your repertoire, I guess, so you can actually get like the big panel raising bits like this one here, uh, you, and you got these. You got bits like this. You don't want to be running that thing in a little lightweight router just because it's this is heavy. Right. This is probably like four ounces, at least. I don't know, something like that. If your router is only a couple pounds, that becomes a much larger proportion of the total weight of that whole thing when you have a little baby router. And while we're still on bits, I think we should take a quick second. At least I like to one clean my bits often and then sharpen them. If I can't sharpen them, I send them out. So to clean them, um, I've shown this on uh, before, but I use this thing from Felder. It doesn't really matter. We just need something that will take off pitch and resin to clean the bits, and that'll help extend the life of the bit before you have to actually go out and send it out for sharpening. And then stuff that's got flat cutter heads, I know you were showing me before we filmed the show, Matt, uh, your diamond plate too. Yeah. I use these little guys here to to let me get into the nooks and crannies of my bits. What do you what do you use for sharpening yours? I use my diamond plate. I got the the, the big uh, diamond plate that I use for flattening my stones. Oh, so you use that as a dual purpose. Okay. These aren't that big of a, that's not a very big amount of material that you're gonna be uh, working here. Right. So I just go up to the edge of the stone and just give it a couple passes and that usually works pretty well. I do that for my, um, I have a carbide cutters for my lathe tools or I have a carbide lathe tool or whatever. And you can yeah. sharpen those things on a diamond stone as well, instead oh, okay. of going out and buying the replacement ones. That's all they are. They're just a little diamond. They're just carbide inserts. All I do is I stick them down on the on the plate and put like a pencil on them with the eraser. Just right. rub them around, sharpens them. Yeah, that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. So it's one of those things for you guys at, at, at home or in your shop. So you guys should you know clean your bits as well, um, especially after you use them for a little bit. And you'll see the the pitch and the resin built up on the bit and the bit will perform better clean and sharp than it will unclean and sharp. And we were talking about that earlier uh, off camera, Matt, when you were doing your cutting boards. Yeah, that's right. So on my cutting boards, I put a chamfer around the edges and that one's really noticeable. I use a really cheap uh, chamfer bit for that. So I can really tell the difference between when it's sharp and when it's dull. When it's dull, it really, it burns and it leaves a lot of tear out that I have to sand out. But if I sharpen it, there's a lot less cleanup but in that case, I'm using my power sander and that chamfer isn't very wide, so it's not a lot of material to clean up, but it is something that's really noticeable. So um, even when I don't sharpen it, it's really just something that's noticeable to me. I can really tell that this bit needs to be sharpened or cleaned because it just leaves so much burning. Well, hopefully you guys learned a lot about routers, router bits, and router tables. Uh, if you have any questions about that, please put it in the, what is that thing called? It's the comments area, the comments thing down below. Yeah. We appreciate any other questions you might have as well. We happen to answer those on the show as well. So we're always looking for more topics and questions and stuff. As always, please subscribe to the channel. We really appreciate it. Um, share it with your friends, your colleagues, your loved ones, everybody you could possibly think of. If you want to find out more about me, you can find me over at MacRamona.com. And how about you, Matthew? Where can they find you? And you can find me at mmwoodstudio.com for all of my social media links as well as projects and other fun stuff. 
Um, in two weeks, we're going to release our next episode about project plans and... And we'll be answering a viewer question about shellac and finishing and stuff. And until then, we'll see you guys in two weeks. See ya! Bye!